What was the real cost of Shenandoah National Park? Ask the people who paid it. The day we left, I remember seeing everything, the furniture on the truck, and my mother and her best friend with their arms around each other crying. Depending on how you looked at it, it was a nightmare or a dream come true. For the first time in American history, citizens were forced to leave their land for the purposes of a national park. It is a story of political aspiration and broken dreams. The heritage of a mountain people blasted away for what the Commonwealth called the good of the state. In this edition of Living in Virginia, a very special story, the displacement of the mountain people. I will tell the world how wonderful Stony Man is. I thank God some sweet day, I'm going to occupy one of these sweet mansions which Jesus has prepared for all who love him, where there will be no oppressions and no national parks. The people should have the sensation that I have, this exhilaration, this experience that I have riding upon here. Consideration promised to be shown to the older mountain folk who had lived in the Blue Ridge all their lives and wanted to live out their days amid familiar scenes. They say not a dollar of their money would have gone into the enterprise. Threatened with sudden death by infuriated landowners, but was sustained by the zest of accomplishment, the joy of combat, the enthusiasm of doing what we were assured was impossible, and in the end, the hope of high achievement for the long-range good of the people of the state. 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 Success has its price. For one man to achieve fortune, another must bear sacrifice. So that billions could savor the wonders of Shenandoah National Park, thousands would be displaced from their land, land cultivated by two centuries of generations. Today, the two million people who visit the park each year may not realize that if they listen close enough, they can hear the hearts of those who loved this land, still beating in rhythm with the crickets. Families lived here, and it is likely that when they were displaced, their souls died here as well. And that is what I remember most about the day we left. Was seeing the truck that my dad had. Uh, I, he'd just gotten someone to move us, and he had everything on the truck. He had come down the day before, or I don't know, it could have been two days before, a week before, I don't know. It couldn't have been too long because he brought his cow and his pigs and his chickens and things earlier. And there was no one down there, down here to feed them, so it, could, he, it was probably the day before. But this particular day that, that we moved, that he moved the family, I remember seeing everything, the furniture, on the truck, and my mother and her best friend with their arms around each other crying. Well, the house was here, but all of this was cleared off then. It was, you had a few shade trees, but all this underbranch stuff has grown up. And we had a path up against the hill there where my grandparents lived. We walked up and down through there, and my mother's clothesline was up in there too. For the past 20 years, well, Professor Charles angry. Perdue and Nancy <laughs> Martin Perdue of the University of Virginia have been studying the history of Shenandoah's former residents, the mountain people. We have kind of concluded that the real disaster was the powerlessness of people to do anything. Uh, probably after the Second World War, a lot would have moved anyway. That's just the nature of things. Guys would have been in the army, they would have gotten 
training or skills or seen other places and eventually many if not most would have moved but on their own and at their own price for their place. This way the price was determined in the, the very pit of the Great Depression when prices were lowest and they had no power to do anything about it. Depending on how you looked at it, it was a nightmare or it was a dream come true. It began in 1886 when teenager George Freeman Pollock looked in earnest toward the glory of Stony Man Mountain. This land would make him famous and infamous, depending on how you looked at it. I will consecrate my life to the development of this, my father's land. I will tell the world how wonderful Stony Man is. George Freeman Pollock. While the Blue Ridge Park Association was reading up on the establishment of a park in close proximity to the nation's capital, mountain women were reading bedtime stories to their children. By 1920, Pollock established Skyland Resort, a place of employment for those living in the mountains. Uh, he used them for his own purposes. He was quite happy for his um, patrons to buy moonshine whiskey from him, but if there were ever any problems, he was quite happy to have them put in jail. I remember that we had to work. We sure didn't sit and watch the TV. We didn't have one. We were, we were supposed to get up in the summertime, and me and my sister, being the oldest, we went up on a little hill, and we'd put a little piece of wood under each arm, and we pulled it in to where my daddy would cut it up in the evenings. My older sister was valedictorian of her class when she graduated, so, and she had gone to school up there, I guess, through the fifth grade, so it wasn't such a bad school, apparently. It was as good as those down here, or better. And my mother had a garden. She always raised potatoes and onions and peas and corn and lettuce. I never did care for none of that. Only thing I really like in garden is potatoes and onions. In 1923, when mountain women were preparing their main courses, Stephen Mather, the first director of the National Park Service, was already cutting his piece of the pie. He and Secretary of the Interior, Dr. Hubert Work, collected funds from the state legislature as well as private sources. But some mountain people gave land too. Some gave an acre uh, because they thought maybe it would, they wouldn't have to move, it would go easier on them or something when the time came. When the Shenandoah National Park project was in its infancy, the assurance was given the residents within the area, if our recollection is not faulty, that they could live there as long as they desired. With this understanding, persons hereabouts subscribed for acres. But for the consideration promised to be shown to the older mountain folk who had lived in the Blue Ridge all their lives and wanted to live out their days amid familiar scenes, they say not a dollar of their money would have gone into the enterprise. Anonymous, 1935. When government attorney Harold Allen suggested Skyland as a place for the park, hundreds of families existed all around it. While Pollock and Ferdinand Zirkel spearheaded the Northern Virginia Park Association, the press was mounting a smear campaign against mountain folk, with unspeakable living habits as its platform. Reports were based on 25 percent of all mountain families. They made better headlines. The exception became you know, the, the model, and I, it's easy to see why, uh, because it's much easier to move people who fit that stereotype than the, the farmers who own three, four hundred acres of land. Uh, we have family photographs of some of those people, uh, and they're dressed much better than I could ever have dressed, or, or many of my colleagues here. By 1925, the Shenandoah Valley Incorporated Group, composed of influential businessmen, bankers, and politicians, had spent over $10,000 in its campaign to sell the Blue Ridge site. But Zirkel was faced with a daunting task, to turn hundreds of thousands of acres of private land into a national park, the first endeavor of its kind in American history. These were people who didn't talk much about that kind of thing. So it leaked out with comments about that old Pollock or um, that old bird, you know, the, the, 
as close to an expletive as these people would use regarding, as my grandparents would use regarding the people they felt were responsible for it. What I picked up intuitively as a grandchild was a tremendous sense of loss and pain. What I remember the most of upsetting my mother because she knew we wouldn't be living that close, you know, there's no way, because we run just across the road there to visit. And I and my mother, I can remember her crying. I don't feel so good about it. And I tell you, I'm sitting in this chair and I'm getting old. But I <coughs> I wouldn't want to see him come in my house, set my stuff out. <laughs> I'd soon be 85 years old. Now, and I get a hold of a gun, what am I might do? The Shenandoah National Park Association set a goal to raise $2,500,000, estimating the cost of purchasing 400,000 acres at $6 per acre. Governor Byrd established the Virginia Conservation and Development Commission, where its chief, William Carson, would collect the funds for the park. The lust for achievement overruled the reality the inevitable fight for the land. I have been threatened with sudden death by infuriated landowners, but was sustained by the zest of accomplishment, the joy of combat, the enthusiasm of doing what we were assured was impossible, and in the end, the hope of high achievement for the long-range good of the people of the state. Will Carson. <laughs> Mountain residents tried to fight, but they were no match for Congress. When enough acreage was taken or donated, depending on how you looked at it, President Coolidge provided the signature in 1926, approving the park's establishment. Shenandoah National Park would revive the ailing Virginia spirit, malnourished by the Civil War. It's fine that the Virginia spirit survived, uh, revived, it's fine that these people got accolades for what they did. It's not fine that it was at the expense of other humans. I thank God some sweet day I'm going to occupy one of these sweet mansions which Jesus has prepared for all who love him, where there will be no oppressions and no national parks, but only joy and love forever. Reverend G.A. Cave, Mountain Preacher. Progress was halted by the stock market crash and the Great Depression. There was a need for serenity, and President Hoover found it in the mountains. I think everybody ought to have a chance to get the views from here. The people should have the sensation that I have, this exhilaration, this experience that I have riding along here. Herbert Hoover. See, well, this was not a New Deal park to start out with although it is now interpreted by the Park Service as being a New Deal Park, because there's no other reason for it. The Purdue's are correct in stating that Shenandoah is not a New Deal Park if you go by the date of its authorization, which was 1924. Shenandoah was legally established in 1935, which puts it squarely within the New Deal. Uh, the Purdue's are correct, and in stating that actually Herbert Hoover initiated the construction of the Skyline Drive, and Herbert Hoover by no means can ever be said to be a New Deal president. But a new chief was hailed. Roosevelt allotted $10 million for the Civilian Conservation Corps to cash in on Hoover's unspent dream. What was supposed to be the Hoover Highway would be the Skyline Drive. Hundreds of families who lived in Virginia's future glorious park would have to leave. So when Roosevelt dedicated Shenandoah in the summer of 36, he marked the beginning of a dream and the end of a nightmare. In bygone years, we have seen, even we 
of this generation have seen the terrible tragedy of our age, the tragedy of waste, waste of our people, waste of our land. Think of it, the thousands of young men, their involuntary idleness three years ago, that ended when they came here to the camps on the Blue Ridge. And since then, they have not been idle. Today, they've ended more than their own idleness. They've ended the idleness of the Shenandoah National Park. The Skyline Drive was built just above our house. And we were there when they were putting the Skyline Drive through that area. And, and, and my dad's potato patch was what is now the parking area, the parking lot, if you walk up on Bear Fence Mountain. While we were there, and they were building the Skyline Drive, they built the whole thing with steam shovels. They didn't have the big um, bulldozer type things that they had now, they called them steam shovels. And um, they had to blast the rock and then lift it up with the steam shovel. And I do remember my mother having to take us away from home every time. They would let her know when they were going to blast. And she would gather her five children and take them down to her neighbor, her next door neighbor, who was her best friend. She was a wonderful woman. They just give you a certain, certain time to, to if you didn't get out. You put, they'd put you out on the stuff outdoors and rain or shine. Before they accepted condemned land, the Commonwealth did provide farms, schools, and medical facilities. In comparison to deteriorating mountain conditions, many families, including Howard Lockhart's, thrived after the move. Still, he hoped that some artifact of his family's heritage would have been preserved. So he went back. And all I could find is a, a horseshoe and an old pan. And the house is gone, and I couldn't even find where the house was. They, they, they tore that down. And it was a little wild on it, running all the way up. I don't know what that was. They could have left them all in there. Uh, they, it would have been cheaper to pay each family some subsistence wages and uh, have them there demonstrating you know, basket making and other crafts that they did and just living their life and then let them, they could move out whenever they, they wanted to. And you could have stipulations if they ever sold the property, the Park Service would have to get the first you know, dibs on that. First of all, I would find the statement that we use human beings as museum pieces rather repugnant. Uh, these are not museum pieces, these are human beings. Uh, would we tell them how to dress, what to eat, you know, when they could appear in their garden? Uh, to some extent it's a Colonial Williamsburg approach to living history, but in Colonial Williamsburg everything is orchestrated. Paint colors, garden, flowers, vegetables. Uh, you can't do that with people who are leading their own lives. Uh, the larger issue is the question that the Park Service must function by the Organic Act, which is our establishing law, and it states that resources will be passed unimpaired to future generations. The minute Shenandoah became a national park, were people living here? They could no longer hunt because the Park Service was trying to reintroduce livestock. Uh, they could no longer girdle trees to get bark. They could not, no longer clear new land for farms. So you're creating, were people being allowed to stay, keep their farms within a national park, you would be creating an inherent uh, contradiction with our Organic Act.
pass by one part, one part of the trail area, and there were iris blooming there. And it was funny how flowers, which are not natural, native to that area, not part of the natural environment in that area, but flowers that were planted deliberately by relatives that had come up in the spring, like the forsythia. Leander said his wife just, if she went up there and saw the forsythia blooming, her mother planted all that forsythia and said she started crying and she couldn't stop crying when she saw the forsythia blooming. But this other woman saw the iris blooming and she just stopped dead still in her tracks and she looked and she said, that's where my Aunt Hetty Bird lived. Hetty Bird Dodson, married to Jack and I, Buchanan Dodson. That's where she lived and she planted those iris there and she was the kindest, sweetest old lady. She always made cookies for us children and we loved her dearly and that's where she lived, where those iris are. There's no sign of a habitation or a house or a foundation, but the iris are there. I mean, a, a national park is supposed to have national significance of some kind. There is no national significance in Shenandoah. There is no, no, no great feats of nature and no geysers, you know, no huge mountains or whatever else. There are no geysers. Uh, there are no bison. But Shenandoah is still 196,000 acres within a one-day drive of 80 million people. And that is something to celebrate. It is, it is wilderness. It is a chance to see deer and fawns for urban people. It is a chance to see bobcat and possibly cougar and back wet bear within a day's drive of Washington and New York and Baltimore. And, and it is a wonderful celebration of a New Deal creation. The mere mention of the park awakens bitter feelings that were never put to rest. But adding insult to injury was hollow folk, an exaggerated sociological study, and The Gift, a National Park Service video. Both were based in large part from the biased research of social worker Miriam Sizer. Oh, that was on purpose so that there, there would be no, nobody objecting, no residents, you know. They, they, they wouldn't feel sorry for the people that moved. They wouldn't feel for them having been hurt. It, it, was, in a, it, was, it was on purpose. The information Marion Sizer produced was perhaps self-serving in the creation of Shenandoah National Park. It allowed people who were moving people to feel good about what they were doing. Marion Sizer and Hollow Folk were never, really, never seriously challenged until 10 years ago. And in fact, the Park Service pulled the book from its shelves uh, nine years ago because we felt it was not accurate and, and it uh, did not give a true story. were planted years ago in the soil of Shenandoah National Park, and it appears that the mountain heritage cannot be weeded out of the landscape. Oh, I'm very proud of it. <laughs> I'm very resentful in some ways that I have to explain it to people, that I have to fight a stereotype. But sometimes I like fighting that stereotype. <laughs> um, when I say I'm from mountain people, they're expecting teeth lacking, they're expecting grubby clothes, they're expecting lack of education. And I come in front of them and say, I'm those people. Those people sacrificed land they cultivated for more than two centuries. A legacy blasted away by steam shovels somehow resurrects itself in each quiet sunrise. And every year at springtime, their souls give fragrance to the morning air. Because no matter how many more trees are planted, the iris still blooms. <laughs>